Uh, Chris Lucinic is the founder and president of Audiovisual Preservation Solutions, a consulting firm that works with organizations on, enable, on enabling archival audiovisual content to become an integral part of the fabric of information as text. Chris believes that this idea is crazy enough that it just might work. Uh, AVPS's clients include Indiana University, the Library of Congress, HBO, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and many other organizations. Chris has been an adjunct professor at NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Master's Program since 2005, subvers subversively integrating audio into courses that he has co-developed and taught from basic issues and training to digital preservation. Uh, Chris's recent R&D work has included several things. Uh, the development of an open source software ap application called BWF MetaEdit, meta um, and leading the ARS Technical Committee study on embedded metadata, and also uh, studying and publishing on the issue of di digital audio interstitial errors, which is the topic of today's discussion. Please welcome Chris to the podium. All right, well, thanks uh, thanks to Tim Brooks and the other folks at ARSC who uh, actually accommodated my schedule, so that's how I ended up in this lineup. And I have to admit, I was somewhat reticent to uh, bring a, a, a session that sucks the humanity out of this morning's lineup. Uh, but for purely selfish reasons, I, I have to also admit that I, I, I felt that that was a very compelling reason. A reminder for me on why uh, I continually delve into arcane technical details in uh, support of preserving and making accessible this amazing content that we saw this morning, thanks to the presenters uh, before me. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll, I, I'm t here to tell you today about this, this interesting project we've been working on now for Geez, over just over a year or so now. Uh, and, and I'll give a little bit of background. It comes out of um, originally a project that was started by a group called the Federal Agencies Digitization Guidelines Initiative. And this is a, a, a group uh, that consists of federal agencies, including the Library of Congress, National Archives, Smithsonian, and, and many, many others. <clears throat> and um, uh, a while back, we, we started to investigate um, uh, uh, Performance testing of audio systems, in short, and 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 uh, I'm going to talk about as as I point out here, there were three uh, tests that we looked at, um, and, and and one was on uh, performance testing of analog to digital converters, uh, one was on uh, what I'll be talking about today, interstitial errors, and and the, and the third one was one that we actually ultimately ended up saying, no, nah, we're not going to pursue that. Um, so that work led to. Uh, uh, some parallel tracks have been continuing out within the federal agencies group, but also doing some work on our own at AVPS and, and, and getting involved with other folks, uh, too, on trying to continue the research and development efforts. Um, and, and part of that work led to a 2010 white paper that was published on digital audio interstitial errors. <clears throat> and this was good because it led to actually getting a lot of feedback from others in the community. Um, after publishing the paper, a lot of people came and said, yeah, actually, this is a problem. Um, uh, I've been having two, or we investigated after we read the paper and we found that we actually have a lot of these issues. Um, so while that's not good in, in, in one sense, it was good to get that feedback and to recognize um, that this is a real issue that needs to be addressed. Um, digital audio interstitial errors is, is a term we actually made up. There is no such error that you will find when you look on a spec sheet for, for a, a digital audio workstation or, or anything like that. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what these are. Um, so actually I'm going to get, well, I had a pointer I wanted to use. We don't have one here, do we? No. All right. So, so the highlighted area is the is where we see this vertical transition. Um, actually, what the represents is is a gap, a, a, a missing samples. Uh, a normal waveform should not look like this. We should see how it looks before and after this this vertical line um, is what we would expect a waveform to look like. That's a more natural looking waveform. So where we see this sharp jump, uh, 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 sharp transition, is a, is an area where. Um, essentially, uh, the digital audio workstation is is recording and writing uh, the information to disk. Uh, there's a system allocation 
uh, uh, resource allocation error where uh, the system, uh, let's just say, gets distracted, uh, loses information, the buffer within the system uh, 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 fills up or overloads, stops writing to disk, and then returns at some point and continues writing. So, so what we're missing, we're actually missing content uh, uh, in, in these. And this is what it looks like. These are all various ones, and, and this one was sent to me by Mark Hood, actually, who's in the audience from Indiana University. This is a quite a bizarre one. It's it's kind of hard to parse exactly what's going on here. It looks like successive. Oh, oh, let me just so so these are somewhat. You can notice that the transition on the on this one is much larger than this one, for instance. And this manifests as a click or a pop in a recording, <clears throat> and it can be uh, very short. Uh, and it can be as there, we've heard incidences where it's as much as you know missing syllables and words and and things like this. So, but but these are hard to uh, to hear. People don't generally hear these while they're listening, uh, it, even if they're listening uh, uh, to the digitized version. And I'll talk a little bit why that is. So this is an example where we we actually uh, had a recording that we digitized. We found we found an interstitial error. We went back, redigitized, and we we wanted to document how many samples. Uh, we're missing. So, uh, uh, in the way of of uh, system processing, uh, we noticed that this is where a pointer would be handy. Uh, I'm just going to stand. So, so this area here is what's cut out of this section down here. So, if you see this waveform, is this waveform here, and it picks up again right here. So, everybody, does that make sense to everybody? So, this section. So this is the one with the air, and this is without the air. So there we're missing about 512 samples uh, of the recording, uh, uh, which, which rep while, while not a lot, and, and when we think about you know, a 96K recording, we have 96,000 samples per second, it's, it's, or it's not necessarily a lot. However, this is missing content. We can think of it as equivalent to having sections of a tape cut out. Um, and, and in the context of authenticity and integrity and, 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 rep, and a faithful reproduction of the original recording, uh, I pose it to be problematic. Um, and we could have as many, as many of these as you might have uh, one uh, in a week. You might, have, you might have none in a week. You could have hundreds or thousands in a week. Depends. This is the, the nature of the problem is that it's intermittent. It's a system resource allocation issue. So as uh, a th the environment being the, the workstation, as the environment changes over time, uh, uh, different software updates are performed, things, different things are going on in the network, uh, just different ways of running uh, your digital audio workstation uh, you can come in and out of these errors. So you could not have problems for months or years and then all of a sudden hit a, hit a major uh, problem until you find it and resolve it. And I'll give you an example. So this is, a, this is an hour, this, this file is about, it's over an hour um, and it happened there were like nine errors in this uh, particular file. Contingency and uh, zoom in a little bit here. Uh, and uh, but refuses to paint any religious picture. Oh, that was. It's the fact that uh, it is in his painting. Rather, it's the fact that uh, it is. No, I think that's actually. My mistake, I mismarked the place. So, ah, uh, shucks. All right, well, I'm not, I don't want to take the time to hunt it down. I dropped a time marker in the wrong place. But it sound, I'll play another example in a moment here. And it sounds uh, like a click or a pop. In that example that I was going to play, there's actually multiple that happen in succession within one second. So we have multiple gaps within a second period that manifests as a, a fairly notable pop. Uh, uh, fellow Americans, ask not what your country... All right, I won't play the whole thing. That one, that, that's the one that has no error. 
I'll play the one with where we took out a, a similar number of samples as would, would occur uh, in, in an actual error. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. So, you heard, did everybody hear the click there where the green marker is? Ask not. So, let me zoom in on that and you can take a look at it. So if you can see, and solo this, the difference between the waveform uh, in the healthy version, which is here, so that the air happens within this space. So there's a, there's in the lower one here, we see a, we see a loss of samples, and I've represented that visually here. So this is actually the missing area that was that was taken out. Now, when you, on a null test, what you do is you have two signals um, that should be identical. You reverse the polarity of one and you sum them together. You should, when they are equal, what you will get is absolute silence. You should get nothing. Uh, and that's what we see on this bottom example. This flat line here is, is that nothingness, right? Um, and where the error occurs is where we get a blip in the in our in our and what we should expect to see, which is 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 digital black. So we we've identified that click. It's very obvious, specifically and exactly what samples it occurred on by 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 performing a null test on on these two uh, these two sources. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody with me? All right. So. So these are, so far this has all been, you know, this is an exploratory R&D project. Like I said, it's happened some within the federal agencies, some outside of the federal agencies. At this point, it's just, there's a, we've identified an issue. We're trying to uh, 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 develop a solution and brainstorming on, on ways to approach that. So there was a recently, as part of the work within the federal agencies, there was a report published just in the past week <clears throat> that speaks to th those three, that suite of three tests that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, Digitizationguidelines.gov is where it's posted, and, and there's that resource as well as a tremendous amount of resources on that website. I would highly recommend uh, going there. Um, uh, but, but within that report, as far as interstitial errors is concerned, the, 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 we, one of the tasks of the report was to outline what is the work plan for getting to, uh, getting to a solution. So the next steps are to uh, develop the test method, uh, the description uh, for the hardware and software sufficient for actually developing the prototype, so to a very technical uh, uh, level of detail, uh, describing what the requirements are for such a, a test uh, system, and then actually also doing some work to, to quantify what the level of interest is in the community. So this is this is something we've talked with about uh, with test and measurement folks in like AES, uh, where we're pushing this through uh, this and and the A to D performance testing to to as uh, uh, projects for development of standards. Um, and when we talk to manufacturers within AES, the Audio Engineering Society, the, the typical response you get is, well, how big's the market, right? Because they're in business to, for business sake and, and, and they're interested in knowing how many people would buy this thing if we created it. So, so we're interested in, in actually quantifying that, not just to answer that question, but also just to gauge how big of an issue uh, this is. Uh, and, and how much, how many resources the federal agencies should be and others should be thinking about putting into this to, to solve it. Um, so, so the we actually imagine that that this could either go through a commercial route. It could also uh, manifest or materialize as an open source project. I think it's a, a, a something that would lend itself to uh, well to to being an open source uh, software solution. Um, and, and using an off-the-shelf uh, device potentially for that parallel uh, capture stream. But, but that's a, at, that, at this point, that's a theory. There's nothing official in the works along those lines. Um, so we continue, you know, continue to seek funding to develop this further. 
Um, and as I mentioned, they're pushing this through the AES. Uh, we've had initial discussions within uh, the Test and Measurement Standards Committee uh, in which they, they uh, uh, were excited about the project, were excited about the fact that the federal agencies have put some work into it already and, and were interested in, in taking the work on. Um, so with that, I'm finished and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, Rob. Oh. We're heading into break time, and I, okay. I, this is an interesting topic, and I'd like as many people to be able to ask Chris questions as possible. But if people need to scoot out for break or whatever, feel free to do so quietly. But yes, go ahead. Uh, the problem mainly manifests itself as missing data, correct? You're asking? Yes. yes, it does. So your null test then at the point that hit a click, it's not going to be silent afterwards. Well, th so so a key part of, of both aligning at the head of to having, a key part of the, and this is one of those details that goes into the, uh, uh, the, the documentation for the prototype, is an alignment tool. So that's, that's critical for both the initial alignment at sample one at which you start comparison, and then at each point at which you right. encounter errors. You're right. That first part should be relatively simple. As soon as you get the first error, you're out of alignment again. That's right. That's right. That's right. So it requires realignment. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> um, comment on the question. Yes. Do you deal with multi track when these things happen? Since it is in the rights, it, it's on all 24 wave files at yeah. the same time. So it's, it sometimes becomes really obvious. But. Um, so you've seen this with 24 tracks across. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Well, that's interesting because we were looking at an alternative approach solution that would use a multi-track editor. But you, but the fact that you've seen that yeah, I've seen it in across all since, tracks. Since okay. That kind of goes to the point of the writing. Um, it's not the converter. It's right. Later, it happens all the way down. Right. Um, so that was kind of where I was going with my question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's good input. Yeah. Sure. I mean, back in the old days, everybody said, oh, don't connect your DAW to the internet and mm -hmm. don't surf the web while you're... Is it, is it as simple as, as a solution to prevent them as simple as that, or is this sort of something more basic going on in the computer that... Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. The, and traditionally, it's kind of been reductionist in that way, meaning that you set all these settings. And there are best practices that we should all follow. It's a good thing not to be surfing the internet and to limit the number of applications and activities going on while you're digitizing. Those are all good practices. However, I don't think it's it's not sufficient to solve the problem uh, uh, that that exists. I think those, even when those, I mean, I've this has been experienced on you know high-end turnkey systems that follow all those rules, and these problems still manifest. They're less likely to manifest, but they still manifest. Yes? Do you see this as an issue resulting from uh, software that might be writing the material, or is it a hardware issue based on the hard drive itself? Yeah, I mean, I really don't. I have, it's kind of, that's kind of going down a rabbit hole in many ways. I think, like, we're trying to think systemically. It's a system issue. It's something that, it's hard, it's really, it would be impossible to say. I think that the reality is, is that these materialize from all sorts of different issues. It could be software, it could be hardware, it could be, you know, motherboard chips, it could be, it could network cards, any number of reasons uh, that could be causing uh, these issues. Yes, Paul. Have you experienced any um, difference in operating systems on PCs and Mac? We haven't looked at that. We haven't looked at that yeah, specifically. Yeah, well, people like to say that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mac guys like to say that. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Twice as many PCs as Macs in my facility. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Well, we have not studied that specifically, no. We have one more question? Yeah. Um, as we've talked about this before, you kind of hinted that this is not a problem in video, but it is in audio. Not a problem in video. Uh, you mean with video signals? Capturing video to hard drive. Well, there are, no, there are issues, but they manifest in completely different ways. Like, uh, and they tend to be, uh, uh, when when a when it breaks at that level within a video system, the system tends to fail. So let, like so, it's not it's not equivalent of say dropped frames necessarily. That's kind of a different level, uh, a lower level of issue within the video environment. But you can kind of think of that as being an equivalent. Thank you very much.
very much. Yeah. If you have questions for Chris, I'm sure you can catch him later in the meeting. Thanks, everyone.